So I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today and to uh, share with you, uh, first of all, some of the findings of the uh, International Migration Outlook 2015 that we released uh, a few months ago uh, in September, uh, but also to uh, discuss uh, some of the most uh, recent uh, developments regarding uh, the refugee crisis in Europe and uh, some also findings that we published in a number of briefs, some of which are available uh, in this room. Uh, I don't know if we can have the uh, PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Is it possible? Oh, it's for me too. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, uh, let me go through this uh, set of slides, uh, starting with this, uh, uh, some findings from these two publications, also uh, the setting publication which was uh, presented, uh, released uh, here in this house uh, on the 1st of, uh, of July in front of the Libe Committee, uh, so the uh, OECD and EU indicators of integration of immigrants and their uh, children. But uh, uh, let's start with, uh, with some figures regarding uh, migration trends to the OECD. What you can see uh, from this first chart is the fact that uh, permanent migration to the OECD in general has been uh, quite uh, responsive to uh, uh, change in the business cycle, that uh, it has been increasing uh, uh, until 2007 up to uh, 4.7 million uh, permanent, new permanent immigrants uh, to the OECD, uh, but uh, decreasing very sharply uh, 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 when the uh, crisis, uh, economic crisis uh, 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 strike. Uh, permanent migration uh, decreased by 20% between 2007 and 2010. It's been fairly stable since. Uh, except uh, in 2014 when we have observed a very uh, sharp rebound of uh, permanent migration to the OECD. And I, uh, so that's plus uh, 200,000 people between 2013 and 2014. And, and it's, it's important to uh, highlight that all this uh, increase, plus 200,000, is actually due to Germany and that in Germany it's uh, due to intra-EU migration. Prior to this uh, refugee crisis, uh, Germany was the second most important immigration country in the OECD after the United States, with almost half a million new permanent immigrants uh, in 2014, among which only uh, about 30,000 uh, refugees, accepted refugees. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the migration, the composition of, of permanent migration to the OECD is still dominated by family migration. This is the most important category of country in a number of OECD countries starting with the United States, uh, more than 70%, uh, but also in, in France, for example. Uh, but free movement uh, within the OECD means free movement within the EU, and a bit also, a small piece of free movement between New Zealand and, and Australia, not waiting much here, uh, frankly. Uh, but uh, free movement migration, which we include in our statistics on international migration, represent almost now a third of, of migration uh, in the OECD. But it's uh, huge variations between countries. As you can see, um, um, for some countries, as a percentage of their population, new permanent migration makes more than 1% in 2013. These data are slightly older. Um, and uh, for the EU total, uh, when you withdraw intra-EU migration from total permanent migration, so you just look at migration from third country, you have a total of uh, just below 1 million person in 2013. Uh, will be probably equal in 2014. This is exactly the same number of people as for the United States. One million permanent immigrants in the US, one million permanent immigrants from outside the EU in Europe uh, recently. Obviously, as a share of the population, it represents a little bit less for the EU compared to the US, but the two figures are mostly comparable. If you 
have here in green as well data for Canada and Australia. You can see that for this country, migration is making a much larger share of their total population. For some EU country, it's also the case. It's also the case when we add up, uh, when we add up intra-EU uh, migration. Uh, I, I emphasize the role of free movement. Uh, free movement uh, has shifted, uh, in increased, but also shifted in terms of origin and destination country. As you can see from the little chart on the uh, higher uh, left hand side, uh, the share of Germany in total EU free movement uh, is now uh, close to uh, a third, 32%. Uh, UK uh, receives about 9-10% of uh, EU free movements and France uh, about 8%. So there is uh, at the same time, an increase in free movement in the EU, but also an increase in the share, a very rapid increase in the share of Germany in this total uh, free movement. When you look at the graph on, on uh, the bottom, uh, these are uh, the main free uh, migration corridors within the EU to Germany up to the first quarter of 2015. What is very clear is, uh, yes, the increase in migration from Southern Europe but uh, these flows have actually stabilized in the past year or so. Uh, Polish migration, migration from Poland remains higher than the total of migration from uh, the three, four, four, sorry, uh, Southern European countries which are included here, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and, uh, and Spain. Uh, but what you see is the sharp increase in migration from uh, Romania and Bulgaria to, uh, to Germany. An increase that is also observed uh, very uh, remarkably uh, in the case of the UK, which is the uh, figure on the higher right hand side of this, of this slide. Uh, as you can see, migration from Southern Europe to UK has also increased uh, very rapidly and actually uh, in, for some time, um, most of the focus was in migration from Greece and Spain to Germany, a lot of media coverage on this issue. But uh, you can see that uh, flows from Southern European countries to the UK are actually exactly comparable to those we observe uh, in Germany according to, uh, to these two differences. Um, with that, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind uh, also the situation of uh, immigrants in the labor market in Europe and how the uh, economic crisis in 2008 has affected these outcomes. You can see here uh, two graphs which show the variation, the evolution uh, on a quarterly basis of the unemployment rate of native born and foreign born in Europe and in the US. In both cases, we've seen a sharp uh, increase immediately after the crisis. Uh, but uh, clearly in the case of the United States, uh, the trend has been uh, downward since uh, and to a point where actually immigrants uh, now have a lower unemployment rate than before the crisis and especially lower than for the native born. This is not the case uh, in Europe where uh, the employment, unemployment rate has increased for both groups, but a little bit more for foreign-born, uh, meaning that the gap between the two is, is increasing uh, still. Obviously, this is an important element to keep in mind, also when uh, discussing the issue uh, uh, that uh, Europe has to face now, which is uh, the issue of the uh, uh, refugee uh, crisis. So let me turn now with uh, some facts, figures, and reflections about uh, this recent uh, uh, refugee humanitarian migration crisis in Europe. I will try to uh, briefly cover three questions. One, first one is uh, why or is this uh, humanitarian uh, migration crisis different, different from the previous crisis? I will uh, try to demonstrate that uh, she is different, or she, or the crisis is different in many respects, uh, but there are also some common aspects with previous crises. 
Uh, second aspect I will uh, cover is uh, the economic impact of this uh, 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 humanitarian migration crisis, and, and the third as, as a conclusion, uh, what uh, could be uh, priorities for, uh, for policy. Uh, so first, uh, why is this crisis uh, different? Is it really uh, different? Um, one uh, um, difference probably uh, with previous uh, refugee crisis, notably uh, in, in the early and mid 1990s, uh, is that we've observed a uh, rapidly changing situation and the emergence of, of new migration, migration or smuggling routes. Uh, we've seen a shift from the central Mediterranean route, which has been there for a very long time, uh, to uh, the Oriental Mediterranean uh, route from Greece, uh, from Turkey to Greece, and then uh, through, through the Balkans. Uh, so that's uh, probably the first element. Uh, the fact that uh, there, there, there are uh, many different migration routes with uh, each of them uh, specific dynamics that we can obviously uh, discuss further. Uh, second uh, is, yes, obviously, that the numbers are unprecedented. They are unprecedented even if uh, we must be clear that these numbers are still uncertain. Uh, this graph uh, on its left-hand side shows the evolution of the asylum application uh, since uh, the 1980s. Actually, the, the year are missing here. Uh, so it, it looks uh, at the numbers from 1980 to uh, 2014. Uh, what you see is that uh, in 2014, we reach for the OECD total uh, almost uh, 800,000 asylum application, which was equivalent to what we observed uh, in, in uh, 1992. Uh, for the EU, it was still uh, slightly below that number. Uh, so. That's uh, as of uh, 2014. But when you look at the right-hand side of a graph, what you see is obviously for the first 10 months of this year compared to the first 10 months of last year, a very rapid increase and that maybe we could expect uh, twice this year, twice the number of, of last year. Uh, we should still be a little bit cautious with these numbers for two reasons. One is uh, that there is a lag between uh, entries in Europe, so basically the Frontex data that I've seen, I've shown before, and the asylum application because it takes time and more and more time uh, for people to uh, fill their asylum application. So there is a lag uh, between uh, the entries and, and the UNHCR data of the Eurostat or EASO data on asylum application. Uh, second is that there are some double counting. Uh, people might be registered twice, uh, might be registered first uh, in Hungary, for example, and then registered again in Germany or Sweden. So the total number uh, for this year is still uh, frankly unknown. But obviously, uh, there is no doubt, it will be uh, very, very high compared to uh, at least the numbers we've seen uh, in the past uh, four or five uh, decades or so. Um, in terms of uh, third point is uh, the strong concentration of asylum application in a small number of countries. And actually, basically, the strong concentration of flows uh, through a limited number of entry points. We're talking about a couple of Iceland, uh, Lampedusa, Coast, Lesbos, and a couple of others. And we've seen this million or so people coming through these uh, four or five islands. Obviously, in the media, that has uh, a, a, a terrible, uh, that creates terrible images, uh, giving the impression that uh, the numbers are probably even higher than what they are in reality. Uh, second point is that uh, this, as we know, because that's uh, some issues which are highly discussed, uh, discussed here uh, in, in Brussels, uh, these numbers are not equally distributed between all EU member states. 
uh, Germany, depending uh, uh, if we should uh, include Hungary here or not, for example, because only a fraction of this 16% uh, of asylum application which had been uh, registered in Hungary will remain in Hungary, we know. Uh, so probably the share of Germany is, is much higher than what appears in, in this graph at the end of the year. Uh, but Germany is, uh, in absolute term, uh, the most uh, uh, important destination country. A number of countries uh, are uh, also largely exposed, uh, like Greece, Italy, and in, uh, in Central Europe, uh, we said Hungary, Slovenia uh, are obviously in the front line here. But it's very important to remind that some other countries are not exposed. Many countries are actually not exposed. Uh, in the UK, the numbers are largely, largely below what was observed in the early 2000. In France, as of October 2015, the numbers are comparable to the numbers in 2014, which were below the number of 2013. So there is no increase in asylum uh, seeking in all countries, and particularly in the country I just mentioned. Uh, Obviously, the other factor that one should take into account is not just the absolute numbers, but the numbers relative to population. And here, Sweden is really the country which is uh, the most affected uh, by the inflow of uh, asylum seekers. Uh, last year, uh, the number for Sweden was uh, almost 0.8% of its population. According to the most recent projection, uh, it will be uh, largely over 1% of the Swedish uh, population if that number is uh, materialized. So far, we are still below, but uh, these figures are up to September, and, and we know that since September, the numbers have increased, even if we don't have yet uh, the final numbers. Again, as you can see, for France, for UK, uh, but also for other uh, EU countries, uh, the numbers as a percentage of their population uh, are, extremely, are extremely low. So not all EU countries are affected. Not all EU countries are affected by this crisis. Uh, in terms of countries of uh, origin, well, something is wrong with this slide. I'm sorry, it looks fine here. But, um, so uh, it's very important to keep in mind that even if Syria is the most important country of origin. If I look at the full year of full ten, first 10 months of 2015, Syria makes no more than 23% of all uh, recorded asylum applications so far. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, but also countries from the Western Balkans uh, are making a large share, meaning it's not only about Syria. Should the Syrian uh, crisis stop tomorrow, uh, the humanitarian migration crisis to Europe might not stop. So uh, it's very important to keep in mind because we might have sometimes the impression that it's only or mostly about Syria, and it is not. Uh, if I look, oh, well, something is wrong here again. Uh, if I look at uh, the evolution uh, of the uh, flows over time, what I, I can see, yes, is from uh, from April, uh, May, a sharp increase in migration, uh, uh, in asylum applications, sorry, from Syria. But you see before, uh, ups and down in inflows from Kosovo, and then from Albania, and more recently uh, from Iraq. Uh, if I look at EU country, Kosovo and DRC are number one in asylum application for France. Pakistan and Afghanistan in the UK, Gambia and Nigeria in Italy, Eritrea, Afghanistan in addition to Syrians, obviously in Sweden. So there is a huge diversity in, in, uh, in the flows of asylum seekers to different European countries that in many respects is unique compared to previous crises and complicates obviously uh, the capacity to respond and to respond uh, in a in a coordinated uh, manner. Uh, another 
difference that we've heard a lot uh, in the case of this uh, humanitarian crisis is the fact that uh, refugees from Syria, notably, have higher qualifications uh, than previous uh, refugees. Yes, this is, this is true. Uh, this data from uh, Sweden, we have very few data on that, actually, but we have some good data for Sweden from 2014, not uh, more recent, show that uh, about 40% of the Syrians have at least upper secondary education, which is much more uh, than, for example, people originating from Afghanistan, 20%, or Eritrea, only 10%. At the same time, uh, only 15%, so among these 40%, only 15% uh, of the total, so a bit less than half of these 40%, um, are tertiary educated. Uh, so 15% tertiary educated, 40% total, at least upper secondary education, also 40% who have at most primary education for Syrians in Sweden. So it's a mixed group. It's not only engineers. It's a mixed group. Yes, it's true. They are more qualified on average than other refugee groups. They are probably more qualified than the groups that we receive in the 1990s. But it's not only about uh, Syrian engineers. And that also complicates uh, notably the response in terms of integration services uh, because uh, uh, you cannot uh, provide the same sort of services uh, to people who have such a large uh, uh, range of, of, of skills if I talk only about the Syrians. But as I said before, it's not only about Syrians. Um, another uh, important element in this uh, humanitarian migration crisis, which contrast with the previous one, is the large and rapidly increasing number of unaccompanied minors. Uh, as you can see, in 2014, it was close to uh, 25,000 unaccompanied minors. Uh, from, for the first 10 months of this year, 25,000 is the number of unaccompanied minors that Sweden has received alone. So for uh, the total of October, it's 16,000 uh, unaccompanied minors which have been uh, registered claiming asylum in, in the EU. So for this uh, only month, sole month of uh, October. As you can see, this is a growing issue. This is not only, and probably not mostly in many countries about Syrians, but a lot of Pe young people coming from Afghanistan, notably, and from some other countries as well. Uh, but this is also uh, new compared to previous, uh, to previous crises. This is obviously a very vulnerable group which require expensive, intensive, and specific support. Uh, and notably when they arrive uh, close to uh, the end of the obligatory uh, schooling age. Uh, so this crisis is different in all the respects that I have mentioned, uh, but it's also different uh, because uh, it's not about only one crisis. There are many crises going on at the same time. With little prospect for improvement in many of the origin country. We don't see when uh, the uh, root causes of this phenomenon will end. And so, uh, but obviously fuel anxiety in the public opinion. Public opinion, which before the crisis was already extremely sensitive to migration issue. So we start from a point where uh, uh, there were many hostile views in Europe against uh, further migration flows. And this crisis come uh, in a way on, on the top of that. So that's all for the bad news. I think there is a good news that we don't stress enough, and which is that uh, in many, many ways, compared to previous crises, we are much better prepared. We have uh, stronger institutions and legal systems, including uh, because of what has been built within the EU. And we have a better capacity to respond, including on integration issues. Uh, the integration policy 
have improved tremendously in the past uh, two or three decades in most European countries. So yes, this is uh, a very challenging time, but uh, we believe that uh, we have the capacity to respond. Let me uh, uh, now go to uh, two or three slides about the economic impact starting with this question of the integration of refugees. We should be clear, uh, integrating uh, refugees and their families in the society and the labor market is more difficult than for any other migration, migrant groups. Uh, as you can see from this graph, which comes from LFS, the 2008 uh, ad hoc model that enables to identify people by category of entry. It takes about five to six years for uh, humanitarian migrants to reach the same level of employment uh, to uh, family migrants. And it takes them about 10 to 12 years to reach uh, the level of uh, uh, labor migrants. So uh, integration of refugees in the labor market is not a quick, uh, a quick uh, phenomenon. All the challenge here, all the challenge, is to reduce that time spent, and we can, we can do it. We can do it if we act soon uh, after our arrival, if we start the integration uh, support services uh, as soon as possible, including, in most cases, before the end of uh, processing of the application for those groups, uh, we know uh, we'll have a high chance to get a refugee status. If we are placing refugees and their families where they are jobs rather than where they are cheap housing, this is easy to say, more difficult to do, but this is obviously a very important point and a lesson we can learn uh, from uh, previous experience. Uh, we can succeed in reducing this time span if we uh, provide uh, uh, very early in the, in the process, a fair assessment of the skills of migrants, as I've said. They are not all uh, tertiary educated, but they have skills. We should take into account these skills, complement them, and uh, provide a, 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 a tailored approach depending on, on their individual situation. Um, we should also link, and that's a more general point probably, also useful for other categories of migrants, link lang language training uh, with uh, on-the-job experience. Uh, with that, uh, as I said, uh, we should not underestimate uh, the short-term uh, fiscal cost, uh, um, fulfilling its obligation in terms of uh, uh, humanitarian policy uh, is not cheap. Uh, we don't do that for economic reasons. We do that uh, for uh, our core values. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in the short term, it, it has cost. Uh, the costs uh, are, are known for a number of EU countries. Uh, Germany, for example, anticipate 0.5% uh, uh, of its GDP in, in additional spending to support the integration of refugees next year. Austria, 0.3%. Sweden, 0.9%. Uh, these are substantial uh, amount of money. Um, Clearly, uh, uh, in the short term, that might have a positive uh, impact. Uh, the OECD, in its last economic outlook, uh, forecast that uh, this additional public spending may act as a demand stimulus uh, and estimated that in 2016 and 17, uh, that could boost the aggregate demand in the uh, European economy by about 0 0.1 to 0.2% of, uh, of GDP. Uh, we looked at the labor market uh, uh, in impact of this crisis. Uh, again, that, that is, is one of the briefs that is available at the back of the room. Uh, it's very hard to say how the flows will evolve. We've made two scenarios, uh, two scenarios, sorry. One uh, being that the, the, the flow will remain stable uh, in, in the months to come. Another one being that the flows will go back to the level observed in 2014. Uh, depending on this high and low scenario, uh, what we can say is that, uh, first of all, we're talking about a large number of asylum seekers. Uh, first thing, a much smaller number, 
of refugees because maybe half, uh, on average, half of, a refugee, of the asylum seeker will be granted a refugee status. Second, that this process will take time. So it's not like uh, 500,000 refugees enter the European labor market tomorrow. Uh, this uh, impact is actually very progressive. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, we uh, estimate that uh, maybe less than one million persons uh, will enter uh, the European uh, labor market corresponding to 0.4% of its labor force. And less uh, than 400,000 in, in Germany or 1% of its uh, total labor force by the end of 2016. These numbers seems manageable. You don't, uh, these numbers will not uh, frighten uh, or, or put at risk uh, the uh, European or uh, national labor markets. Uh, but obviously, uh, depending on our capacity to uh, value, recognize and value the skills, complement the skills of refugees, integrate them in the labor market, the short-term fiscal costs that I've mentioned before uh, will, will turn uh, only in the medium or in the long run into potential economic uh, benefits. Let me end with this slide. Uh, uh, priorities for policies, I think I can sum up that saying that uh, I hope we can be more reactive, uh, more, sorry, more proactive <laughs> rather than uh, reactive. Uh, yes, we need to continue uh, to focus on tackling the humanitarian urgencies. Uh, including by reinforcing the burden sharing mechanism and I think that the discussion which is uh, uh, popping up now about uh, the need to look again at the resettlement plan, not only at the relocation plan, but at the resettlement plan, which was there initially from April in the European Agenda for Migration. So it's not a new idea, it's just an idea that we have overlooked. Uh, this is an important step forward in that direction. But that being said, there are many other things that we should also not forget. They may look like uh, medium, terms issue, medium term issue at this moment, but uh, we should tackle them now. That includes reinforcing cooperation with countries of origin and transit, notably with the objective to undermine the business model of smugglers. Basically, we can say uh, that was the focus of the uh, uh, Lavalette uh, summit. Uh, but we also need to better anticipate possible policy response in light of alternative scenarios for future development, uh, trying to anticipate what will come next in 6, 12, 18 months. I'm not sure uh, we are prepared to all uh, scenario here. We need to be prepared to welcome family members of refugees, uh, they will be in large number, uh, whatever are the change in policy uh, that we are considering now. And we also need at the same time uh, to have more efficient and organized returns, uh, also to uh, show to the public opinion that we can manage uh, this crisis uh, through uh, these different angles. We need to focus more on the integration of refugees and their children. Uh, that should be uh, now coming up as a priority, we believe. And uh, last but certainly not least, and I will end with that, we should tackle fear regarding migration in the public debate. Because if we don't do that, there is no way uh, we will uh, make the most of migration in, uh, in general and and face uh, the challenges which are associated to this refugee crisis. Uh, as uh, Secretary General say, integration, integration, integration. Thank you very much.